www.ruhrgebiet.org. Calvary Chapel presents Pastor's Perspective, a one-hour program that gives a biblical and pastoral viewpoint on the theological, social, and practical issues of the day. We'll be taking your calls in just a moment. But first, here's today's host. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesday edition of Pastor's Perspective. I'm Don Stewart, along with Pastor Chuck Smith, here to take your questions and your calls, as we do every day, Monday through Friday, actually Monday through Thursday, 3 to 4 Pacific Time at one 564 6173 That's the number you dial, 1-888-564-6173. If you have a question today about what we believe as Christians, why we're Christians, or how a person to live the Christian life, one 564 6173 is how you join us. And if you want to watch the program live and in color, you're near a device that gets the internet, you can watch it on his channel at www.hischannel.com or the live webcast at www.kwve.com. Chuck, welcome to the program. Thank you, Don. Great to be with you once again. Okay, well, here's the latest. In about 48 hours, we're told, there's going to be a limited war. Uh, The U.N. says wait four days, but uh, it seems it's going to happen about 48 hours from now. Uh, The U.S. has said this is not to change the regime there in Syria, but basically to attack about 50 sites that are launch capability of launching different nerve gas and and weapons like that to destroy them. So that gives time, of course, to Syria to move their assets out to covered areas during those times. Uh, After two or three days of air bombardment, it seems the Allies will call it a day, and that's it. Now, that's the plan right now, but Chuck, as we know, plans don't always work the way we think they will, will they? (laughs) No, that's very, very true, Don. And, of course, this is an interesting thing that's developing over there, Yeah, and we're just watching it. Actually, uh, day by day, yeah. uh, expecting and knowing that something's going to respond and react, but we just don't know what and to what degree and so forth as yet. Yeah, and here's some of the latest things, Chuck. As you've been noting, probably, that Israelis are rushing for gas masks because they fear retaliation about a strike on Syria. Unfortunately, True. there's only about enough to cover about 60% of the population because of budget cuts. I'm sure they would probably want to rethink that now, but it's a little too late. Iran said thousands of missiles are going to rain on the Jewish state if Syria is attacked. Now, that could be a possibility because we know Hezbollah, the Iran client state, is right up there in Lebanon. So, Chuck, uh, that is certainly not out of the realm of possibility, is it? No, it isn't. But, of course, uh, why in the world, I mean, would they attack Israel if uh, the U.S., of course, attacks Syria? (laughs) I mean, it doesn't make sense, you know. Yeah, except that everything in the world is Israel's fault. The, you know, the, the problems yeah, in Egypt so now, you know, the up, the rising up of the military was actually an Israeli <laughs> plot. I mean, every they, they blame Israel for everything, and they don't seem to need much motivation. But anyway, it seems that we're really coming down to the wire. Most, uh, you know, uh, wire reports we get, the, the, the assets are in, in ready or getting ready for the Allies. So about 48 hours from now, we assume something will begin. A, again, a short war, we're told, is what is planned, not a re- regime change just to wipe out these uh, command and control centers, some of these places where they could launch uh, these missiles that would have this nerve gas. But beyond that, uh, again, we will see, and it's going to be very, very interesting and a, a wild week coming up. And as you well oh, know, yes. Chuck, in the Middle East, um, nothing is for certain, is it? No, it surely isn't. And of course, we are living in extremely 
critical and exciting days, Don. Yeah, and indeed we are. So we'll keep an eye on that, and we'll just see what's uh, going on. If anything develops actually during the program, we will we'll bring that up to right. you. But it's one of these things where it's literally ongoing. I'm keep my eye on the, the news. Uh, literally moment by moment, a couple of the stories just flashed across. The one about the Israelis on rushing for gas masks in the Iran just came out with the thousands of missiles. Uh, they just said that are going to rain on the Jewish state. So we will see. We will see. All right, well, let's talk to the people out there on this Wednesday's pastor per, Pastor's Perspective. We'll go first to Yorba Linda, California, and talk to Beth. Hi, Beth. You're on the air with Chuck Smith and Don Stewart. Welcome to the program. Thank you. You're very welcome. What can we do for you, young lady? I was wondering if you know that the streams of water flowing from the rocks that Moses hit with his staff are still flowing today? Uh, that's a great question. I never thought of that, Chuck. The waters of Meribah, uh, they're in, uh, what is it, Numbers, where we read about that? Uh, right. Where Moses, right. you know, hit it twice instead of hitting it and then speaking to it, and the water came out of the rock. Do we know if the water, st- uh, actually, do we know where the rock is, and do we know if the water's still flowing from it? I, I don't know the answer. Do you? Well, uh, Don, there is an interesting article that uh, uh, declares that they do believe that they know the rock and really? uh, that, yes, that uh, it, it is not water flowing now, but <clears throat> there was obviously a stream bed hmm. that was coming from that rock at one time. Interesting. And of course, as you, you know, look down the, the, uh, the uh, valley there, I mean, yeah. it's formed by the stream bed. And so it's it's an interesting thing that they do believe that they know exactly where that rock was. Yeah, interesting, and 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 that wouldn't be surprising, of course, because there are geographical references there. Thank you for sharing that, Chuck. Right. And and what it does show is that again another separate indication archaeological oh. evidence of the historical accuracy of Scripture. Right. As, as we mentioned on this program before, the former professor of Assyriology at the University of London, D.J. Wiseman, said about two decades ago, there, and this is two decades ago, plus over 25,000 separate artifacts have been discovered that verify the history of the Old and New Testament, including monuments, archaeological discoveries, coins, scripts, etc., etc., and there would be another one. And so, uh, yeah, uh, interesting, Beth, I learned something. I didn't know that, and that's that's fascinating. So, uh, great question, young lady. So, can you tell us out there, Beth, uh, your age, if you don't mind? Twelve. All right. Well, excellent question. Good to have you, Beth. Yeah, good to have you, and I learned something today. That's great to know, Chuck. And uh, next time in Israel, I'll have to go, and if we can, uh, at least in the area there, and investigate that. That would be great to, great to see. All right, good, and we always love to hear from the 12-year-olds, too, Beth, so please, please oh call yes. us back. Excellent question, and, that, you know, it's a good, good thought. All right, Daniel from Los Angeles is with us now on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, Daniel. Welcome to the program. Hey, how's it going? You two, I really uh, thank y'all for what you do. I appreciate you. I know y'all doing the best you can uh, yes, sir. In, in answering these answering these calls. But um, <clears throat> you, you, y'all mentioned something uh, the other day. I was, I was just trying to um, confirm on this because I know we're supposed to refrain from, like, any type of speculation, right, about as far as what's in the Bible and what is not. Right. But, um, in Revelation, it mentions um, about the horror of Babylon and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, yesterday on the show, y'all mentioned, I mean, I'm, mm. I'm trying to, like, make sure that the Holy Spirit has <clears throat> the, you know, full amount of ability to mm-hmm. bring union to, to all these churches and whatnot. And y'all mentioned um, that y'all think that, that the Horror Babylon is the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. I mean, isn't that speculatory? Is it not the Holy Ghost that that determines who is the 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 Horror Babylon? Isn't it his job to to determine that and, and we, not yourself? Wait, well, we're not determining that, Daniel. We're reading what the Bible says, and the way it's described, it sounds like a counterfeit religious system at the end of time. And what we see today in the Roman Catholic Church, and in great measure the Protestant Church, you know, traditional, the uh, established Church, is exactly what we see in apostatizing from the faith. So the Bible tells us what's to expect, and that's what we see. Chuck, uh, your thoughts on that? Well, that's exactly it, Daniel. We, uh, we're not saying that it is the Roman Catholic Church. We're saying that uh, there is a, uh, the whole Church system uh, today, uh, both Catholic and Protestant, uh, for the most part, are really a sort of uh, unregenerate, and so uh, we can see it in both, but not uh, not just the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, and we're not saying it's just that. It's the organized church or organized religion, organized Christendom. Right. Basically what's happened, Daniel, is organized Christus, 
Christendom has apostatized, as it were, and what we see today in the Christian Church, uh, you know, at least the visible Christian Church, doesn't represent the, the basically the teachings of Christ and the and the words of Christ by and large. I mean, you go to many of the churches today, the big organized ones, and what do you see? You see, uh, you know, um, everything taught but the Word of God. It's denied the infallibility of Scripture, the trustworthiness of it, Jesus being the one way to get to the one God. So there's a lot of problems like that we're running into. And that's what, uh, you know, what we were commenting on. That's going to happen in the last days. But again, that's at the end of the Great Tribulation period. But we see uh, the precursor of that even today, the apostatizing or the falling away of the organized church. And that's what's predicted. And we just call them as we see them. All right. Placentia, California. Next, and David is with us. David, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. God bless you, Pastor. It's good to talk to you. Thank you. Um, there has been some references to Damascus being destroyed in a day, and I think it's from Ezekiel 38 and 39, one of the two, and I couldn't find that reference in the Bible. You can help me out. Yeah, no, it's in Isaiah, and so that's why he couldn't oh. find it in Ezekiel. Ezekiel, th- yeah, there's two... <laughs> Actually, there's a yeah. That'd be one of the reasons why you couldn't find. Yeah, uh, Chuck, this whole thing about Damascus being destroyed. Help uh, uh, Daniel out and others that are there. Or David out. Excuse me, David. Others that uh, wonder what's all going on here because it, it looks like a prophecy that we believe um, obviously hadn't been fulfilled because the city of Damascus is still standing to this day. But there seems to be a time coming, doesn't there, that it will be basically destroyed. Um, you know, in, in, immediately as it were. Obliterated. Yep. Right. Yeah, and that is the prophecy there, and um, again, we, we see that in Scripture, and the question is, when will it happen? And uh, it's still something in the future. Now, uh, it seems to be a supernatural thing that goes on uh, with Damascus, doesn't it, Chuck? That, uh, uh, or, or can we... It's a judgment. Yeah, it's, it's a, a judgment yeah, of God. Yeah a, yeah, a judgment of God. And so, with the judgment of God there, we'll see how... You know how it all happens, uh, right? Whether it happens, uh, you know, uh, immediately, whether it ha- yeah. yeah, or something. So <laughs> it, it's going to be one of these things that does happen. It's it's Isaiah se- uh, seventeen is the passage there. You want uh, uh, David on that particular passage on Damascus being destroyed today. It hasn't. It's no longer a city. It's a heap of ruins. Uh, Isaiah seventeen one says, and it hasn't happened yet, and it's going to happen still sometime in the future. And and so Damascus will be in the crosshairs in uh, God's program and God's plan because Damascus historically many times, not all the time, but many times has been a major is- enemy of the nation Israel. All right, Jody, uh, Judy, excuse me, from Yuba City, California has got a great question for us. Hi, Judy. Welcome to the program. Hi, how are you today? Good, thank you. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if God has passed judgment on me already mm-hmm. and whether or not I can be saved. Mm-hmm. Why? Why would you say that, Judy? Um, from my past. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm 51 years old. Um, just from my past life, kind of like a wasted life. Uh huh. How I see it. Um, and I've just recently, in the last few years, gone back to church and kind of. Um, I never really believed in born again or anything like that, but I came to realize, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. um, that it is something. But I was afraid that I was cut off from God, that I've come too late. I see. Well, no, you're, you're not asking the question. Chuck, help Judy out. Well, Judy, actually, you're the one that Jesus died for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it is for people, uh, that, you know, uh, as long as there's breath, I think there's hope. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the Lord is uh, very gracious, and uh, certainly unto all of us he is so gracious. And the enemy would like to rob us of the joy uh, that we can have knowing, uh, the joy of confidence that Jesus has done a uh, thorough job in cleansing me of sin and all, and where I should be rejoicing and just thrilling, uh, thrilled with what God has done, He would keep me, you know, in in questions and doubts and mm-hmm. uh, in defeat. And so, be rejoicing, Judy, that yes, He has forgiven. Yes, you are His child. Yes, your assurance of salvation is complete. Yeah. So, Judy, you do believe in Jesus now, don't you? 
Oh, I believe in Jesus, yes. Well, that then that's all that the Bible says. Now, like Chuck said, Satan is trying to put doubt in your mind. You know, you know, you're at an age where you're thinking, well, I've wasted my life, I'm too old. No, it's never too old, never too late. We see people no. come to Christ in their 80s and 90s, actually, and have a turnaround. So, no, right. no. Uh, Chuck, How can I come to Christ? Okay, well, Ch- uh, Chuck, help Judy out. If she's not sure, maybe you can lead her in a prayer that uh, so she can know for sure once and for all she is a believer. Well, Judy, actually, it's just uh, acknowledging uh, that he is the Son of God, acknowledging that he has died for your sins Mm -hmm. and that through your faith in him, he has granted you the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life with him. So uh, just uh, (laughs) I want to just pray for you and just trust the Lord uh, to really do a work in your heart today, Judy, that will remove the doubts and all that Satan might throw up against you and just to uh, cause you to be in a a position of just rejoicing Mm -hmm. in what God has done. Father, Judy has called, and Lord, you see her heart, and you Mm -hmm. see uh, the uh, problems that she's going through with the enemy trying to torment her Mm -hmm. and let her know, Lord, that let her think that... uh, your work uh, wasn't sufficient for her. Mm. But Lord, we know that you did die for all of our sins and that many, many people have forsaken you, have uh, actually turned their back on you. But yet when they finally came to the realization of who you truly are, Mm. uh, they've accepted and are now, Lord, serving joyfully. And so we pray for Judy, Lord, that she might come to that joyful relationship with you, Lord, where she just really experiences uh, the fullness of your love and of your spirit. Mm. And Lord, just let her overflow with the joy of the Lord, that it be her strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And indeed, Judy, uh, there was a criminal next to Jesus on the cross, and all he said was, remember me. And that was enough. And that's basically all you've said is, you know, can I get saved? Yeah. Yeah, of course. You Once you acknowledge that you want to, he that's where the Lord comes and meets you. Now, you're in Yuba City, and we know a very good church there in Yuba City, don't we, Chuck? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. I have a uh, nephew that has yep. a church there in Yuba City. Exactly. So if you're not going to the Calvary Chapel there with our good, you know, Chuck's nephew and my good friend Bob Fromm, you need to try that, Judy. Check it out. And they will, you know, sit down with Bob or someone on staff, and they can encourage you and give you the assurance of salvation. Because, Chuck, there's a lot of Judys out there that the enemy is lying to that tells them they're not saved. Oh, yeah. And um, I'm so glad you told her what she uh, she needed to hear. And the rest of you out there thinking, well, I'm too old or, you know, God wouldn't forgive me. No, if you you still want to be saved, that's the whole point. You can be saved, and you can be saved right now. So, Judy, yeah, get a hold of uh, them if you're not already doing that and sit down with somebody and let them just walk you through it and encourage you in God's Word because you need to do that. But... Rest assured, if you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says you will be saved. So people pray for Judy from Yuba City, California, that the Lord would just speak to her and encourage her because she reached out, and that's all we're supposed to do. All right, uh, God bless you, Judy. Let's go on to Menifee, California now and talk to Jonathan next on Pastor's Pers- uh, Jonathan, uh, we got to get someone with their phone, uh, radios on. Okay, let's go to Andrew from Murrieta. we get Jonathan to turn his radio off. Andrew right next door in Murrieta, California. We'll try him now. Andrew, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi, how are you gentlemen doing today? Good, thank you. Um, I had a question. Um, some of my friends were telling me about this name it and claim it thing, uh, mm-hmm. I guess theology and... I wasn't too sure, and the way they explained it to me, it seemed kind of wrong. So I was just wondering if I could get some clarification about that, and then also if I get a prayer request. Yeah, what, what's your prayer request, Andrew? Uh, that my marriage would be uh, brought back together, and that the Lord would restore uh, me and my wife. You got it, sir. Okay, Chuck, the name Amen. it and claim it theology. We will definitely pray for your marriage there, Andrew. Okay, Chuck, we're very familiar with that. Explain to Andrew why that is something that's just not biblical. Well, actually... Uh, it puts you in the driver's seat instead of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it gives you the power uh, of ordering God uh, what to do. And so, uh, you know, it, they're just saying if you have enough faith, you can just say it and it will be uh, come a reality. Uh, but th- the idea of God's will or God's purposes aren't really even taken into that. And that is not right. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if he hears us, then we've received the petitions that we've asked of him. So is it his will that your marriage be restored? Yes. Indeed. And so that's a wonderful thing that we can pray with real assurance that it will be, uh, that God will work there. And so we're just going to uh, pray for you now, Andrew, that God will bless in this marital situation. Mm -hmm. Father, we do bring Andrew to you and uh, his broken marriage. And Lord, we pray that you would just really work mm -hmm. by your Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, Lord, that's in his wife's heart that is holding her back and uh, causing her, Lord, to uh, be disaffectioned uh, from mm -hmm. him, we pray, Lord, Lord, that you'll just remove that and uh, restore the love that was once there, the love that brought them together in the beginning. And Lord, we just pray that they might enjoy again uh, the joy of uh, just living with one another, living in fellowship with you. Mm. In Jesus' name, Father, work, we pray. Amen. Amen. That's Andrew from Murrieta, California. We're going to pray for you, Andrew, that uh, marriage gets back together, that God would touch your wife and just show her that uh, you need to be one in Christ. And um, again, many people be praying for you along that line. All right, let's uh, now move on to Dallas, Texas, and talk to, talk to Lance next on Pastor's Perspective. Oh, well, Lance, are you there? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. You're on the air. Uh, yes, I had a question about the Sabbath day, one of the Ten Commandments, keep yes. the Sabbath day holy? Yes. Uh, well, my mother, she's dead, dead now uh, since 2008. She used to be at Seventh-day Adventist. She goes to church on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. And just just going through school and, you know, learning about the calendars and where the days fall, uh, mm -hmm. Sunday being the first day of the week. Right. I just want to know, you know, should we all be, you know, focus on going to church on Saturdays versus Sunday? And, you know, uh, to my understanding, they have pretty much the same almost Christian-like uh, beliefs, but just going to church on a different day. And, you know, I just didn't want to fall short of the glory. And, yeah, you know, okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Chuck, first of all, is there a correct day to go to church uh, for believers in the New Testament era? Well, Don, uh, the Bible tells us that one man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. Deep. And so as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. every day is a holy day. And uh, uh, not, not one day above another. I do worship and do believe in worshiping God every single day of the week. And just whether or not it's a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or whatever, I believe that worshiping Him is the important thing. And I think when you try and uh, limit it to a day, and I think that that's one of the problems with the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that uh, sometimes they used to uh, say that, you know, uh, the worship on Sunday was the mark of the beast mm -hmm. and you couldn't be saved if you worshiped on Sunday. But they've, removed, they've moved themselves from that radical position and are more uh, generous now and are at least allowing that if we don't know that the Sabbath day, uh, you know, law and so forth, that we are free from it. But when you go to the Old Testament, and in Exodus there, when it talks about the Sabbath day, it says that it is uh, for the nation of Israel. And it is God's sign between the nation of Israel that they are his special nation and that their keeping of the Sabbath was the sign of the fact of their special relationship that they have with God. But it wasn't for all of the other nations, but just for Israel. Yeah, that's Exodus chapter 31 there, Lance, and you start at verse 12 where the Lord speaks to Moses and he says, Tell the Israelites, surely you must keep my Sabbaths. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. And he goes on to repeat it there in verse 16. The Israelites must keep the Sabbath by observing the Sabbath throughout their generations. And then he repeats it a third time in verse 17. It's a sign between me and the Israelites forever. And so it's something from the nation of Israel, not the New Testament church. And so if you're read the New Testament clearly, you'll find Colossians 2, 16 and 17 tell us just the contrary. Don't let anyone judge you with reference to new moons, Sabbaths, or holy days, for such things were a shadow of what was to come, but the reality is Christ. And so if someone wants to worship on the Sabbath, God bless them. But if someone wants to worship on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, yeah, I mean, again, it's every day is, is a day to worship the Lord. And it's moot right. here, isn't it, Chuck, like we say? I mean, um, yes, you <laughs> bet. <laughs> we've got something going every day. And so it's not limited to one day. Now, the early church 
took Sunday, the first day of the week, as the day to meet because they were showing the world something new happened. And this this is profound, isn't it, Chuck, that a Jew would change the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday, and then first believers were Jews, to demonstrate their belief that Jesus Christ had indeed risen from the dead. So something as, like a resurrection basically was the only thing that could change that day of worship, couldn't it? That's true. And Sunday was always looked upon as a a beginning of a new week. And so it is the day of new beginnings. And uh, what a glorious Mm -hmm. thing that the church is meeting on a Sunday uh, because of the new beginning that we have in Christ Jesus. Indeed. So that's what it's at. So again, uh, Lance, I I encourage you to read Exodus chapter 31. Start at verse 12, and you read from 12 to 17. You're going to see the Lord repeat repeat it three times how the sabbath yes. is a covenant an agreement between himself and that particular nation then go to colossians 2 16 and 17 you'll see the new testament church is not under that authority all right uh, back to the phones we go to west covina california yolanda is with us now on this wednesday's pastor's perspective hi yolanda welcome to the program oh thank you for um taking my call good afternoon god bless you guys thank you god bless you Thank you. Um, I have a prayer request, and I also have a question. Sure. What can we pray for you for, Yolanda? I want to pray for my mom, please, um, for the Lord to open her eyes to the truth. You got it. We will pray. Okay, and my my question is, uh, my mom believes that Jesus is her Lord and Savior, but doesn't believe in the Trinity, Mm. so is she saved? Uh, Why doesn't she? Let me ask you that first before we answer the question. What, what, What makes her reject the doctrine of the Trinity? The Bible doesn't say Trinity. She, it doesn't use the word Trinity. That's one of the arguments. Okay. okay. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you can tell her the Bible doesn't use the word theology either, which means the study of God. So by that definition, the Bible doesn't teach us to study the nature of God. But anyway, uh, Chuck, um, for Yolanda's mother, she says the Bible doesn't have the word Trinity, which it doesn't, but the teaching is certainly there. Help Yolanda out. Well, actually, you know, it isn't necessary uh, to believe in the Trinity, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Bible says, and you shall be saved and your house. And so uh, we believe that uh, it's it, Jesus is the one who has come from the Father, uh, died on the cross to save us from our sins. Hard for us to actually, uh, you know, understand uh, the Trinity, but, uh, you know, uh, surely when Jesus was there on the cross and he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who was he calling mm-hmm. upon? Who was he asking this vital question of? Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, it shows that he and the Father, uh, though one, were, were actually being separated because he took upon himself our sins. And so, uh, it's, uh, but you don't have to believe that uh, Jesus is the only one in order to be saved. I mean, uh, the important thing is that you do believe in him and believe upon him. And uh, so uh, with your mother, I wouldn't really be worried about her salvation, uh, but just that she has put her full faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, would you pray for Yolanda's mother too, Chuck, that she would come to a more fuller understanding of the nature of God? Father, we do pray that Yolanda's mother will just have a, a real work of your Holy Spirit wrought in her heart as you reveal, Lord, uh, the fullness of your spirit and your your love under her, and the fullness of your nature, uh, the uh, the uh, triunity of uh, the Godhead, made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We ask you this, Father, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. That's Yolanda from West Covina, California. And Chuck, you you said it right in the prayer. Triunity is actually a better word than Trinity because it emphasizes two things, unity and diversity. One God, one substance God, but, you know, revealed in three distinct persons or centers of consciousness, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So there's unity and diversity, and that's the, uh, you know, the triunity, again, probably would be a better way of explaining it. We use the word Trinity, which does the same uh, job, but triunity is probably a a, a better uh, term to use. Okay, Yolanda, we'll be praying for your mother that God would open her eyes to the fullness of what the scriptures say with respect to the nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and continue to pray for you. We're about a minute away from a break, Chuck, so I don't want to try and take another call before we go to the break. One quick question for you. 
If you're living in northern Israel tonight, uh, what do you do besides pray? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I would sure be in prayer if I were living there and knowing that, you know, uh, tomorrow morning rockets could be flying. And so, uh, you know, it's a thing that uh, your your faith and, and your hope has to be in Christ Jesus. It can't be in, you know, uh, your defense systems or whatever but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, and we do have people watching and listening to us from literally around the world. We know there's people in Israel that listen to this program too, and we're praying for them. We're, yes. you know, we're praying that God would show a supernatural protection there. But it is, it is a dicey situation. It really, really is, people. So pray for the people of Israel. Pray for the uh, uh, this whole mess. Again, just, Lord, your will be done, because it's kind of hard to know even specifically in many instances what to pray here, because the two different combatants there in Syria are the bad and the worst. You know, the Assad regime and the the al-qaeda you know inspired terrorists who are trying to overthrow him so anyway we'll continue to pray for that all right up to a break halfway through the wednesday edition of pastor's perspective i'm don stewart along with pastor chuck smith taking your calls and questions at one 564 6173 we'll be back in a couple of minutes so don't go wandering off Every Christian woman has a calling upon her life. If you're in the workplace Monday through Friday, you have a ministry. If you're a wife or a mother, you too have a calling. Or if you simply are going to school, you have a ministry. The question is, have you laid hold of what God has called you to do? Or let me ask you this, are you sure you know what your calling is? Well, ladies, I have a special surprise for you. The word for today is making available the When Leaders Lead Women's Conference on DVD with a bonus MP3 that has over 40 messages to assist women to discover God's call and then to equip, teach, and encourage them to minister the gospel to others. Topics include how to witness to loved ones, balancing ministry and motherhood, coping with conflict, counseling with compassion, discipling others, and knowing the Lord's will. There are even messages geared to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and teaching a Bible study. To find out more, call the Word for Today at 714-825-WORD or contact them online at thewordfortoday.org. I want to see people. Calvary Chapel Music is thrilled to announce the newly released CD, Together as One, with Jim and Amy White, a beautiful mix of contemporary and classical songs of worship. To order your copy today, visit us at cccmmusic.com. That's cccmmusic.com. Or drop by the chapel store here in Costa Mesa. KWTH Barstow, Las Vegas, KWDS Kettleman City, KWVE HD2 San Clemente, AM660 and 102.5 KWVE Oil Dell Bakersfield, the K-Wave Radio Network. We welcome you back to the second half of the Wednesday edition of Pastor's Perspective. I'm Don Stewart, along with Pastor Chuck Smith, taking your calls and questions toll-free across America at one 564 6173 Before we go back to the phones, a couple stories, Chuck, since we began the program. One is um, the uh, financial industry here in the world, Wall Street, That is the, the oil market is jittery. U.S. oil hit a two-year high today. And they're really worried if violence uh, spills over into other countries there in the Persian Gulf, the Middle East, uh, the price of energy, amongst other things, going. And then what's also interesting, uh, Representative Scott Regal from Virginia, who served six, a Republican from Virginia, who served six years in the Marine Corps Reserve. He sits on the House Armed Services Committee. 
And uh, he represents a district, congressional district, the largest concentration of military personnel of any in the nation. Well, today he called on Speaker of the House John Boehner to call Congress back into session to prevent President Obama from usurping Congress's constitutional authority to authorize or not authorize the use of military force in Syria. Uh, again, Congress is the only one that can declare war according to the Constitution. You know, can they dance around that, Chuck? Is not really war. You know, it, it's it's sort of interesting. That the way they're trying to get around this sort of thing, because it's not officially a war, but you're, you're, you're in all intents for all intents and purpose. You are. What do you, what do you say about that? Well, they've danced around it before, Don, yeah. and of course, <laughs> you know, it, it, someone has said, "Figures don't lie, but liars <laughs> sure can figure." Yeah, indeed. So they're going to go on do what they want to do, right? Uh, the administration That's true. Yeah, and uh, Congress, uh, yeah, uh, you know, to um, whether they go for it or not, they're they're going to make up their mind and do it. Now, right. if, if what they say is true, and again, we don't know if it's true, Chuck, it could be over basically before it starts, and these worst case scenarios may not come about. But um, we know in the Middle East, nothing is, the only thing certain is uncertainty there. I mean, you can't sure. count on anything, so we'll keep our eye on that. But it is interesting, this one GOP congressman who's, you know, whose district consists of the largest concentration of military personnel in the nation. He didn't want to see a war go on. And then again, uh, what we see with uh, Wall Street and the oil market getting really jittery, the price going up to the highest level in two years now and worrying. Uh, energy, you know, it's tough enough living in these days with the price now. We don't need another spike, so a lot of things could go really, really bad. We will just wait and see. And again, yes. moment by moment, literally, we're watching this unfold. If anything else comes up during the program, we'll let you know. But right now, back to the phones to Batty, Nevada, and Jerry is with us. Jerry, welcome to the Wednesday edition of Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Well, hi, Pastors. How are you? Good, thank you. I just want to thank you for those updates. I, those are crucial, really. The times we're living in, it's <laughs> unprecedented. And I did, did one uh, yeah, comment right. before my question I, I think it was last Friday I heard the, um, I think, World News briefing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was like, I don't, I don't want to say taken aback, but I that was a classic program. I think it was Dave Rolf. Yeah, Dave Rolf was on. We were talking about technology, because as you know, Chuck, Dave is a real techno nerd. He's been on the cutting yes. edge of all of that. and Yeah, and, and just revealing some of the things that, how much technology is uh, basically uh, covering our whole lives, and uh, you know, how, you know, some eight-year-old with a computer or some genius could um, really throw off, you know, like what we've seen. In fact, as since we talked about Jerry, we mentioned yesterday, were two other uh, uh, organizations hit with, uh, you know, uh, denial of service. Service. So there have been, uh, you know, websites going down. A big organization like the New York Times, Amazon, the Stock Exchange, Google, and uh, Twitter yesterday, and and it was New York Times. So yeah, that's what we were referring to. How easy it is for what we're trusting in every day, Chuck, just to uh, yes. fall before our very eyes. And yeah, that's that's the program last week. It was really interesting, Dave, talking about that because uh, we we don't realize how how dependent we are on these sort of things. So thanks for mentioning that, Jerry. Uh, Dave did a great job talking about that. Well, yes, and I just want to see how relevant that was, and I would hope to hear more of you uh, um, together. You, so you sound like a team. Oh, well, he will be back. Uh, Believe uh, me, he will indeed. Yeah. He's a good man, and uh, he, he really knows his stuff. Well, thank you for that. So what oh, can you're we, welcome. What can Excellent. we do for you today? My question is in regards to Second Corinthians 6.14 uh, about being unequally yoked together mm -hmm. with unbelievers mm -hmm. and all the way down as far as light and darkness and righteousness and so forth. I understand it, of course. Uh, to be with a man and a woman uh, in marriage, and also uh, in a business relationship, I believe. My study Bible um, also mentions about non-Christians uh, being together, bound with non-Christians in any enterprise or relationship that would be detrimental to the Christian's testimony. I have a long uh, time friend, quarter of a century, very faithful friend, he says he prays to the Lord all the time. I don't know his situation, you know, at, at about uh, mm -hmm. really being born again. He, uh, I've invited him to church, and he has come in the past. But we're looking to uh, possibly uh, rent together, or he might buy a house, and I might be, you know, uh, you know, a renter or, or you know, something where we be equal in a house. Right. So would Second Corinthians six fourteen apply to that? And I'm asking specifically uh, about. I know it says in my study Bible, going a little deeper about my uh, Christian's testimony. I've got sins still that I'm dealing with, and I'm not perfect. And 
uh, yet here, you know, I've got a good buddy, sure, um, and you know, he, he prays the Lord every day, and. So what's your take on that uh, and Pastor Chuck? No, it's a great question, Jerry, and it's very practical, and a lot of questions that be similar out there, I'm sure, Chuck, people just raise their hand. I've got a similar one like Jerry. I've got a, you know one of these uh, difficult relationships, a business relationship. I'm not really sure whether this person knows the Lord, loves the Lord. How how much should I commit myself to someone like that? Chuck, what, what wisdom do you give people? Because I know you get this all the time. What do you tell them? Well, just understand that problems are going to rise. Yes. I, I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, when it's a marriage, mm-hmm. uh, then, you know, you uh, are held together by the marriage vows and all. Uh, mm-hmm. But with just a, a kind of a business kind of a thing, uh, the, you know, marriages, you're going to work it out. But uh, there isn't that same pressure to work it out when you're not married. And so I, I believe that, uh, you know, <laughs> these kind of arrangements uh, they may be convenient, but uh, just expect problems to arise. Yeah, and you can't anticipate, Jerry, everything that's going to happen. And the problem right. is, there's no, you know, you can't go any type to Christian arbitration if the other person isn't a Christian. So what almost always happens is somebody ends up suing the other person, and it's just a big headache for everyone. And it's better just in many cases, if not most, to pass on something like that, because there's not a, you know, as the Bible says, can two walk together unless they're agreed? And, you know, you're going opposite directions spiritually. You have a different outlook on things. And what if something comes up that would compromise your Christian convictions? And, and the other person says, wait a minute now, it's a moneymaker. Well, what do you do? That's, that's what kind of things happen in these type of relationships, and that's why it's just not a good idea. All right, let's go back to the phones and talk to Marco from Pico Rivera, California, next on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, Marco. Welcome to the program. Hello. Thank you for having me. I actually have a prayer request, and I have a question. Sure. What's your prayer request, Marco? <clears throat> uh, actually, my uh, my ex-wife uh, brought me to uh, to Christian uh, church, uh-huh. and now I guess she uh, she met some guy, and she had I guess he has pulled her away from uh, the Lord, mm. and also with uh, away from my uh, my daughter's relationship. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, so I always I always try to pray that uh, the Lord brings it back to him first, and then so she could try to have a better relationship with my daughters. And, yeah, uh, you got it, sir. My request. We will pray for her for sure, Marco. Okay, what's okay. the question we can deal with today? Actually, on Matthew eight, uh, I think it was verse twenty two, it says, "Follow me, let the spiritually dead bury the, their own dead." What does he mean by that? Yeah, well, actually, it's so let the dead bury the dead, the the spiritually dead. That's that's a bit of an interpretation there in uh, the uh, the text in Matt. It's eight twenty two. Let me see if I yeah leave the dead to bury their own dead is literally what it says. There's no uh, spiritually there. Uh, Chuck, who are who is it referring to? And that's you know that's one way of an, answering the question, just interpreting the, the the passage when you translate it and deal with it. But Jesus said, "Let the dead bury their own dead." What's he talking about? Well, actually, uh, if you read some of the commentaries on that. Uh, it was a uh, common excuse uh, that people would give for not reacting or responding right away. And so uh, you would ask them to do something, and they said, well, I need to bury my father first. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the father would be in good health, alive, and so forth. But he's just saying, you know, down the road a ways, you know, I'm going to consider it. I will consider it. But right now, I, you know, I'm going to de- just take care of other things. And so uh, that's basically the idea uh, where he said, well, you know, let the dead bury the dead and you come and follow me. In other words, the urgency of responding right away to follow Jesus Christ. Yeah, and there's always an excuse that people can make for not following Jesus today. I'll put it off right. till tomorrow, but as the book of Hebrews emphasizes, today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. And so, uh, you know, people have all sorts of excuses for not believing in Christ, not following him today, and Jesus wouldn't put up with any of them. Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead, he said. Okay, Marco's prayer, Chuck, for his ex-wife, who has been pulled away by a new relationship uh, and his kids. He's worried about, too, uh, being pulled away from the Lord. Would you please pray for her, for the children, that God would just turn her back to the straight and narrow? Father, we do ask that you would work in this marriage. Hmm. And there are so many out there uh, that are having marital problems. And so if we pray, Father, hmm. that there will be a real work of your Holy Spirit in restoring relationships and restoring the love that once uh, bound them together. And Lord, with his wife, we pray, Father... Hmm 
that just really speak to her heart. And Lord, let her realize for the sake of the children, it, it's w worth uh, keeping things together. Mm. And so, Lord, just help. And we just ask you, Lord, work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Marco, we will be praying for you, for your ex-wife, for the kids, that, that God would work and put them back, uh, put her back on the straight and narrow uh, path. All right. Uh, thank you, brother, for the call. Let's now go to uh, Bell Gardens, California. Nate's been waiting a long time. Nate, thanks for your patience. You're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hey, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is about uh, Ephesians 4.11. Mm -hmm. It says, and he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Yep. I was just wondering, I know they're all supposed to teach the message, but what are the differences between the five? No, good good question, Chuck. The different offices and, and, and positions in the church, what's going on there in Ephesians 4? Well, actually, apostles, prophets, and pastors, teachers, uh, they all are there, and they all have a responsibility, but it isn't the same. And if you have a gift as, a, as of a prophet within the church, it isn't the same as a gift of an evangelist or a gift of a pastor teacher uh, that uh, in each of these different various ministries uh, there are special anointings special gifts to carry out that particular ministry and so basically he's just enumerating the uh, different ministries and uh, of course uh, recognizing that not all have the same calling not all have the same ministry but there's a diversity of gifts and a diversity of operations of those gifts. And uh, so it's just recognizing uh, the unity in diversity. Yeah, the idea, Nate, is we are a body. We're to help each other, and God has gifted as he will. He has divided in the body of Christ different gifts for different operations so we can all work together for the cause of Christ. And we're, again, all as a unity, as a community of believers to, you know, promote the gospel with the different gifts he's given us. And Ephesians 4 talks about the gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 lists the number of gifts also. And so uh, these are there to for the edification, the building up of the body of Christ. So just listening, distinct gifts, the apostle, the prophet, the, the uh, teacher, and then the pastor. All right, back to the phones we go. Let's go to Victorville, California now and talk to John here on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, John. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, first of all, I have a prayer request I'd like to pray about. Sure. What's the request, John? Okay, the request is I had a relationship years ago, 20 years ago. She broke up with me. Mm-hmm. And she finally wrote a letter after 20 years later. Mm. And, and that does not make no sense to me why she did it, you know. And um, it kind of bothered me because I gave myself to the Lord 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And um, I've been listening to the ministries on the radio station, you know, for almost only probably like about 15 years. Uh -huh. and, it, and it's been helping me out a lot lately. Good. And when you had Pastor Greg Glory on there about a week ago, uh, last week, mm -hmm. for the um, Harvest Crusade, I give my I get I rededicate my life to, um, oh, to my Lord and Savior. Wonderful, Christ. John. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this letter shows up to confuse you, right? So okay. Yes, it did. We will pray that you're that you know we know God is not the author of confusion. And isn't no. it interesting, Chuck? When someone wants to dedicate and they turn their life over to the Lord, all of a sudden, wave a blast from the past comes. It's uh, not yeah. a godly <laughs> one. So, John, we under believe me, we understand those. We see them all the time, and so that means you are right on the straight and narrow, good brother, because the enemy has lost you, and you're back on where you should be. So anyway, what you, we'll pray for that. What's your question for us today? Okay, the question is this, that um, I re I'm reading uh, Philippians um, mm -hmm. chapter 3, verses um, 7 and, and 18. Right. You know, what does it mean about that, um, so, you know, we'll seek the prize? Oh, that seek the prize 17 and 18 is talking about becoming uh, mimics or pattern yourself after me. Uh, uh, are, you, are you thinking more about verse 13 maybe and 14 there? Oh, okay, yeah, probably that's the one there. Oh, okay, yeah, because the other one I'm looking at, it, that talks about be careful how you conduct your life, uh, you have a oh, okay. pattern in us and that. So it's the one earlier. But okay, okay, seeking the prize. Prize, I keep, you know, forgetting those things which are behind, or I, you know, uh, you know, looking forward pressing, to the stretching. Pressing towards the mark. Yeah, pressing towards the mark. What's the prize he's referring to, Chuck? Well, of course, the prize is just, uh, uh, to me, it's when I stand before the Lord and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Indeed. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll now make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And that's the prize I'm looking for, the prize I'm seeking. 
Indeed. The prize there, well done. That's the only words we want to hear when we, Amen. the first words when we, <laughs> we see the Lord Jesus. Anything else, yes. that's, you know, it, that means we've, we've been faithful. All right, John has that prayer request. Uh, Chuck, he's rededicated his life to Christ, and all of a sudden he hears from someone he hadn't heard from in 20 years um, out of the blue, and he's very confused by this, and we know God is not the author of confusion. So would you pray that John would have some peace in all of this and understand where all this came from? Father, we do pray that you give John great wisdom mm. uh, at this particular time uh, because of this contact uh, that is ultimately or just out, uh, in, in mm. time is, has shown up again on the radar screen. Mm. And Lord, if it is of you, uh, then Lord, we just pray that uh, you, you have a purpose in it mm. and that uh, maybe he is able to witness to her and all. But Lord, mm. just guide and direct yes. and give him great wisdom. And discernment in this, hmm. we ask in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen, indeed. So, John from Victorville, California, we'll be praying for discernment uh, for you that God would would give you the you know the right things to say or not to say in this particular situation. It can be, as we know, very very difficult. All right, to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, way back east, and Daniel is with us. Daniel, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. How are you, Pastor? Good, thank you. Thanks for answering the call. All right. All right, my question for you is, uh, as we see on Genesis, God created heaven and the earth. Right. And then uh, we see all the way to Isaiah 14. Right. Uh, we see that God is speaking about uh, Satan himself. Right. And um, how he says, that I'm going to rise above the throne and be like the Most High God. Right. And then we see back in Genesis that God says, let us make men according to our own image and likeness Mm -hmm. so could i say that god made man uh what the devil wanted to be is that correct well okay did god make human the human race chuck with what the devil wanted to be or why uh, again or can we even try and maybe infer that from the creation of the human race you know i i I find myself at a loss at a question like that because when you ask why did god and so forth i don't know yeah and it's one of those things that is difficult to understand uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I really just don't know, Don. Yeah, we're not told something like this, Daniel. So if we're not told, we none of us do know. We could speculate, we could guess, yes. but that's all it would be is a guess. Um, God did create the human race, but if you're talking about if Satan wanted to be a different order of being, because the angels, were, there are no atheists amongst the angels. They all knew that there was a God that existed. There was no ignorance there with us. We have to believe by faith, and that's the distinction. Uh, the devil was lifted up with pride. The angel who became the devil, he, he didn't create the devil. He became the devil or the adversary by the rebellion against God in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, as you mentioned. But this is not something that God wanted or created. This is something that came to pass when this personage rebelled against God. So whether he wanted to be like the human race or that, we're not told, and so it would be only speculation. We're not real big on that. If God doesn't tell us, then you know um, we just don't know. That's our answer. And nobody else does either, so we don't feel too bad about that. All right, let's come all the way back west to Hacienda Heights, California, from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and talk to Irene. Irene, you're on with Chuck Smith and Don Stewart. Hi. Hi. Hi, Chuck. Hi there, Irene. Hi. I've been trying to get a hold of you. I have a question, Chuck. Um, I've been, um, first, I have a prayer. I've been married for 34 years, and my husband is having an affair, and he's a Christian, and mm. he's, you know, he's... He's out there right now. He took off right now, and I'm been really, really sick. Uh. But my question is, he has the Holy Spirit. He's always been a believer since he was, I guess, 14. And he was um, worship. He was in um, Bible um, Sunday school teacher and all that. Oh, my. Mm. And is, is the Holy Spirit, like I, I, to- I told him today, I go, David, do you have the Holy Spirit? And he goes, yes, I do. Can the Holy Spirit leave you? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Okay, uh, Chuck, what's happening there with the situation with Irene's husband? Here he's uh, uh, cheating on her, having an affair, seemingly not denying it, but he still claims to be a believer, and Irene is worried about him and his soul. So what would you tell her? Well, actually, the Holy Spirit definitely uh, will not participate in this ex- uh, relationship that he's seeking to develop. And uh, so he is walking away from the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit, and uh, we just uh, will have to pray for him that God will open his heart and let him return 
to a relationship and a faith in Jesus Christ because what he is doing is certainly opposed to what the scripture tells us we are to do and how we should live and and thus he is disobeying the word of God and and thus alienating himself from the life of God as he does it and and of course the Bible talks about Satan's strong delusion and uh, when a person gets involved in something like this Satan takes over and blinds their eyes that they cannot see the truth and they are deluded hmm. and he is deluded in this relationship as Satan is trying to paint it up as you know the ideal perfect girl <laughs> and the thing that he's been missing and so forth and uh, suddenly you know the marriage does, doesn't look that attractive and uh, this new relationship does offer a lot of excitement and it and uh, you know attraction and so we just need to pray that mm-hmm. God will open his eyes to the truth and let him just see how blinded he is mm-hmm. and let him turn away from this new relationship and seek again his relationship with the Lord. So will you pray for now, now Chuck? Oh, you bet. Okay. Father, we bring Irene to you, and we ask, Lord, that you would just really comfort her heart mm. in this situation. And, Lord, we pray for her errant husband, mm. uh, that you would bring a strong conviction of sin. Lord, open his eyes to the truth. As Satan has blinded his eyes and is deceiving him, mm. Lord, we pray that you'll open his eyes and let him see the subtleties and mm. uh, all of Satan who is out to rob and to kill and to destroy trying to rob his relationship with his wife, trying to kill this uh, wedding or this uh, marriage and destroy, Lord, uh, the years that they spent together. So, Father, work we ask Mm. in Jesus' name and heal this relationship, Father, and we thank you for it. Amen. Amen. And bless your heart, Irene. We'll be praying for you and Amen. for your husband that he will definitely see the error of his ways and, and, and truly repent and come back to you and ask your forgiveness, God's forgiveness, and realize that this is not God leading him into something like this. And Chuck, unfortunately, the Irene story is going on way too much out there right now in our day oh, and age. Head. as We're seeing uh, both from both male and female, each of them finding their soulmates later in life, it seems, and then, uh, yeah. you know, rejecting rejecting the person they made a commitment to and um, and then and then blaming God the sad they blame God a lot of times don't they say well God oh, yeah. yeah and that's that's just unconscionable when yeah. people do that and so uh, we will be praying Irene for um, him for you for uh, this woman he's having the affair with too that uh, they will you know be convicted of their sin and uh, he will turn back to you to the Lord and walk the straight and narrow Okay, Chuck, less than a minute to go, and so we're going to keep our eyes on, you know, I, like I said, I've been watching oh, yes. watching the uh, news the whole time here. We've been doing the program, and it's it's been amazing how things are just, you know, other stories, even as we've been talking the last half hour, breaking uh, left and right. Um, we need to pray for this all the time now, don't we, the next uh, couple of days, because this could, this could lead into something catastrophic. Who knows by tomorrow at our broadcast... Yep. What will be happening, you know, Don? Yeah, literally, who knows? Only God knows. So uh, people get on the knees, pray for Israel, pray for the wisdom for our leaders and that whole situation, the people in that part of the world, that this doesn't turn into something that, uh, you know, could be so catastrophic, we don't even want to even think of what could happen with the weapons that are there today. Uh, it's been suggested today Assad would use the chemical weapons again if uh, the Allies uh, would strike against him. So we don't want to see that either. So we'll, we'll again, tomorrow, 24 hour, 23 hours from now, when we get back on we'll see what's going on so in the meantime for pastor chuck i'm don stewart thank you so much for being part of the program those that didn't get on please call back tomorrow we just couldn't get to you but uh the time's up so until tomorrow at that time three o'clock pacific may the lord richly bless bye-bye We pray you've been blessed and that you'll join us again for another edition of Pastor's Perspective. The preceding was sponsored by Calvary Chapel and K-Wave.